We're back, live from Sync Summit. We managed to catch up with Academy Award nominated and Grammy winning composer, songwriter, and artist Robert Kraft. Robert, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks. Um, you know, you started as a recording artist, you started as a songwriter, and you then went into working at the studio at Fox. And now you're back as a recording artist, and you released a box set and you were performing again. How, how did it feel to, to be doing all that after such a long break from it? Uh, I was surprised how naturally I took back to it. I really was surprised because I assumed that it was a part of my life that I had, a chapter almost that I would closed off mm -hmm. because I, I learned it while I was at Fox that my brain truly works on two paths. I, I could only do that job full time I could be musical in my job, but to be creative, I needed a lot of silence and space and be kind of dreamy. That's the way I used to write songs. I'd walk around and write songs and practice. So after I left Fox, I was, took a while to kind of get into this place where I started to realize I have a lot of time and I'm my own boss. And it actually was at a dinner party that afterwards I played, kind of, come on, play some of your songs. No, I don't play anymore. Oh, go ahead, play. And I played about an hour at this party, and everyone made me feel like, wow, you got to go out and play. And this was during the period that I found out that two labels were actually releasing compilations of my work. And I thought, to celebrate that, I'm going to go play a couple gigs. So I did it. It's been a gas to play live. It's been wonderful to feel that part of me again. I'm not sure it's a career move, but it's been really wonderful to be reminded. It's like somebody who skis and plays tennis. I went out and hit a couple to, you know, on, a, on center court for a minute and it just felt good. Okay. I, I, I'm curious, you know, you, you were a recording artist, you made all those records, and then you suddenly, it's not always a natural move. I think you were probably the only film music executive who ran a major motion picture studio music department who was a recording artist. I don't know of anyone else who, who came from that background in that particular job. So I'm, I'm curious, how did that role come about where you went from being an artist to being the head of music? It is uh, something that I've often wondered myself okay. because um, it was a call I got out of the blue. Okay. And like all things, it was you know, luck is the residue of design, Branch Rickey said when he asked how he ended up with, of all players, to integrate baseball, how did you end up with Jackie Robinson, the greatest? And it was, he said, luck is the residue of design. You want something to happen, and then sometimes luck finds you. I had been evolving from just piano player to songwriter to recording artist, and now I was producing records, I was scoring films. Things kept developing, and Ironically, one of the films I worked on was The Muppet Christmas Carol, and I only mentioned it was ironic that I thought at that point, my career's really in a weird place. I'm doing Muppet records. I was going to be a rock star, and now I'm producing Miss Piggy. You know, how did that happen? However, it was at that job where I suggested to the Henson Company that they start a record label, that they start a music division because I was just I was making records for them and thought you don't want to put these out through somebody else look at Disney they've got a mm -hmm. Walt Disney Records there's really no competition in the children's space you should start a record label and they said why don't you start it for us of which I had no idea what that meant but of course said yes I'd love to um, so while I was truly learning on the job how to start a label and a music division for children's entertainment company. Of course, in Hollywood, from the outside, it looks like, wow, there's a musician and a recording artist and a songwriter and a composer who's also starting a label, not realizing that inside, behind closed doors, it's all those things who doesn't have a clue how to start a label. It must have looked good because suddenly I was being approached to be, would I be interested in being the head of music at Fox? which I found tremendously surprising, and it came out of the blue. And I always thought, really? You're, you're sure that's the choice you want to make? 
I even hesitated, because for a number of reasons, and one of them was that I used to say, I said to my mother, this sounds really adult. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a big graduation from being songwriting nuthead to... At a big company. At one of the biggest media companies in the world. So I thought it sounded very responsible, a lot of pressure, and she said the smartest thing she ever could have. She said, why don't you try it for a year or two? See if you like it. Uh, 18 years later. I liked it a lot. So did you, you had no idea what the job was going to entail when you took it? Absolutely none, as I've been reminded a lot by the people that were there when I started. The very first thing I said in my very first staff meeting, I sat in a staff meeting with 40 people and said, I know less about this job than everyone in the room, so you have to tell me how it goes. I mean, I'd scored films and produced soundtracks, right. and I'd never looked at budgets. Somebody said, can you score this movie? And I'd say, yeah, I need an orchestra, and I need a mambo band, and I need you know, some xylophones for Little Mermaid, whatever it is. And somebody would always sort of say, okay. They probably behind closed doors were making sure that it was right or if it was too expensive. But I had never really looked at the film music budgets, the record budgets. I was really the creative. And suddenly, in that first day, yeah. I'm being asked, I'm being asked to start this movie on my first day called Waiting to Exhale. Mm -hmm. And I'm showed a budget, I'm being told Forrest Whitaker is the director, and we want to get Quincy Jones to do the music. The and it's a music driven film. Right. And I remember coming, coming home that first day with a complete stomach ache. And the next day, actually, I called Quincy Jones, who I knew, and um, I actually left a message, and he called me back, and we had a talk, and I called. Um, I called my parents after that call and said, Quincy Jones just called me. And my parents said, he didn't call you. He called the chair you sit in. You're the head of music at Fox. Don't think he's calling you. Interesting. Um, but it actually was, Quincy said, I can't do this, but I know this young songwriter named Babyface who would be really great for it. So and I was, you. it was the first day, that was the first day October 4th, 1994, and it's funny because today is December 4th, and I was thinking it is, ex I left on October 4th as well, oh. last year, yeah. so today's 14 months exactly. Wow, okay. Yeah. So he, he referred you to Babyface for the gig? We went to have breakfast a couple days later, and he said I should meet this guy, Kenny Edmonds, known mm -hmm. as Babyface, who I was aware of, and he had a couple hits, and he'd written a song for Tony Braxton that I love. Right. And, uh, Wow, is that a great, magnificent project because Kenny Edmonds just hit it. it. There's not even a park in sight. It was so far out of the park. Yeah, he knocked it completely out with Whitney. Number one and, single, yeah. Whitney, Aretha, Mary J, mm -hmm. Tony, uh, Brandy. Yeah. It was huge. It was wonderful. Nice. Yeah. Now, subsequent, I mean, not subsequent, but following that, I mean, you essentially did. I believe it's 300 films during your tenure at Fox. That's a lot of films and a lot of music. And what, what I want to ask you is, being a composer, being a producer, being a, a writer and performer, how did that help in terms of dealing with dozens of composers and songwriters for your projects? I mean, you could speak their language, literally, and, and do what they do, and had done what they've done. So how did that help in your relationships with all of the people that you work with creatively? Oh, it's funny. There are actually two questions there. How did it help and how did it help in your relationships? Yeah. Because they're both. It helped in the actual physical nature of getting the music for the films mm -hmm. in that I can't imagine how you would do this job without knowing, number one, I think that should be an A minor, not a C. Mm. And I said things like that a lot. And occasionally people would say, how do you know that? I kind of ignore them and try not to be insulted. And um, But I could actually talk the language completely. It'd be like being in a t French school and not un knowing how to speak French. Right. I was in a recording studio with the greatest musicians in the world. I'd better be able to say, when people say this isn't working, which is often more often the case than not in anything you do when you're making a film under great pressure and delivery deadlines, 
it just isn't working is what you hear a lot. And somebody has, the composer's done what he thinks it should be, the director thinks he should have, studio executive says, I think it should be this. Somebody has to step right in the middle and say, I have a suggestion for how it could work. Often that's something as simple as just saying, let's play it a little slower. Let's take out the snare drum that's making it feel like a rock cue and see if it can be a little more romantic. But somebody, you can't just say, I don't know, what's that? It just, so on a physical nature, thank God I'd spent years in a studio and had written a lot of music, so I could just say, let's look at it. From a physical point of view, it was being a subcontractor for a house. And when the shutters didn't fit, I could say, yeah, you know what? We need a different kind of tool and maybe some different material. And on a relationship-wise, probably more crucial than the musical. Because I'll tell you a secret if you don't tell anyone else. Okay. Musicians are sensitive. <laughs> Don't tell. <laughs>